Good morning, everyone. Hopefully more, some of us are more awake than that. Dedicated series, or step four, if we're following the steps towards salvation. And this week is confess. Confess. Now, I have a confession to make that in putting this series together, if you look on the front of the pamphlets, there aren't any numbers. There's no one, two, three, four, or five on those pamphlets. And so actually when I was putting this together, I had confess before repent because I thought confess was confessing of sins. Well, that kind of makes sense. And then you confess and then you repent from those sins. So that order made sense to me. However, once I started reading it, I was wrong. And repent is confessing those sins and turning from those sins. Confessing is confessing Jesus. Confessing the name of Jesus. Confessing your beliefs in Jesus. And so this is what today is. The first week was hear. We have to hear the word. The next week was believe. We have to be able to believe what we had just heard. And because we believe what we had just heard, it causes us to change our lifestyle and repent of the life we lived prior. This week, we confess. We confess the name of Jesus as our Lord and Savior. And I know most of you would like me just to stop right there and dismiss us and we could go on the rest of our week. However, I'd be doing a huge disservice to this step, to confession. And so as we, as we look at this, we'll go through three different points. In order to confess, we have to know what confession is. We have to know what it means, or else we might confuse it with confessing our sins, like I did. And so with that said, we're going to jump into here. First, we're going to go through Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 11. Hopefully, this should sound familiar to what we went through not too long ago, about two months ago at this point, when we studied Romans. But we're going to go a little bit deeper this time. If you openly declare that Jesus is the Lord and believe your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it is by believing in your heart that you are saved. As the scriptures say, or as the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. Jew and Gentile are the same in this respect. They have the same Lord who gives generously to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now I know this sounds a little off-putting. This sounds nice at first when we first read it, but then when we look at other scriptures, it may sound kind of contradictory, doesn't it? Well, if everyone who calls on the name of the Lord is not, or is saved, then what does it mean in Matthew chapter 7? What does it mean in verses 21 through 23 when it says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. We cast out demons in your name. We perform many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Well, if I read Matthew 7 and I read Romans 10, don't these seem to be in contradiction to each other? No. These aren't in contradiction. These are in, how do I write this here? These don't contradict each other. They confirm each other. These aren't contradictions, but confirmations. Now, if we look back to Romans 10, if we look at verse 13 here, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Notice Paul puts this in quotation marks. Why does Paul put this in quotation marks? Hopefully your Bible, like my Bible, has a little asterisk beside this, and then in the bottom footnotes it, says, it references Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 32. Paul is referencing the day of judgment when he talks about everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. When it comes down to it, whether we are saved or not, the final judgment day, everyone will finally know the truth. 
everyone will know that Jesus is who he says he is. That God is the creator of all things. When it comes down to it, at the very end times, whether it's too late or whether we have been saved, it won't matter because we will all finally know the truth. Hopefully you're on the side of actually hearing, believing, repenting, and confessing. Hopefully you're on that side of things. However, if we look at Romans 7 and we look at Roman, or Matthew 7 and Romans 10, like I said, these are confirming each other, not contradicting each other. If we look back to verse 9, or verse 11, as the scriptures tell us, anyone who trusts in him will never be disgraced. If we read just before that, for it is by believing in your heart that you are saved. It is by believing in your heart that you are saved. It is not by the works that you do you are saved. And we talked about this a lot in Sunday school, and it's interesting how Sunday school, the last couple of weeks, have tied directly into the service. I don't believe in coincidences. This is happening for a purpose. This is happening for a reason. The reason Sunday school is tying into worship service is because God has something bigger to tell us this morning. If you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Now, if we look at Matthew, it says, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, most of us stop right there, but we have to look at the next part. Only those who actually do the will of my Father will enter heaven. We have to be actively seeking the will of God. We have to confess the name of Jesus and actively, actively be seeking the will of God. I know a fair amount of us have turned on the TV before and seen those on TV who are blessing people and casting out demons and putting hands on the heads and all of a sudden they fall over and demons are released or they put the hands on the heads and someone walks up and gets out of a wheelchair for, that they've been confined to for their whole life. Now is that actively seeking the will of God? Is that casting out demons in God's name? Is this seeking God or is this seeking self? That becomes the difference in these verses. Not everyone who calls out Lord, Lord, because they're not actually calling out in the name of the Lord with their heart. Do the things we confess with our mouth confess the feeling of our hearts? Is our mouth confessing what our heart is saying? And that's where we have to look at this. This brings us to our first explanation. Confession is a personal decision made public. Confession is a personal decision made public. Now, I know that may sound kind of strange. Well, if it's a personal decision, why do I have to make it public? by the way you act, the way you do things, the way you talk, does any of that actually confess you believe in Jesus? And so by you confessing the name of Jesus publicly, you are declaring not only in your heart but with your words and your actions that you also believe. So if you look at John chapter 12, verses 42 through 43, it gives us a little bit of insight to what we are discussing here. Helps if I turn to the right page. Many people did believe in him, however, including some of the Jewish leaders, but they wouldn't admit it for fear the Pharisees would expel them from the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than they loved praise of God. They loved human praise more than they loved the praise of God. It says here, many people believe, including some of the Jewish leaders. Last couple weeks ago, we looked at John 3.16. John 3.16, Jesus wasn't confessing this to a wide group of people. He wasn't teaching this to multitudes. He was simply telling this to a religious leader of the day named Nicodemus. Nicodemus believed in Jesus. 
But did Nicodemus follow Jesus? Or is he more worried about his standing as one of the highest religious leaders of the day? What are we confessing? What are we doing here this morning? Do we love the praise of God or do we love the praise of humanity? Or do we love the praise of our neighbor? Do we love the praise of those around us throughout the community more than we love the praise of God? We follow God. We believe in Jesus and yet our words and actions are more to please others than to please God. Simply put, it is God who saves us or it is our neighbor who saves us. Is Jesus the way to paradise or is it the politics I believe in that is the way to paradise? Is it Jesus that sacrifice saves me from condemnation or is it my job, my coworker? the name of Jesus, it must be a decision we make. It must be our faith. We must declare who Jesus is to us personally, not to the world, not who Jesus is to our ancestors, not to who Jesus is as our parents, not to who Jesus is in our spouse, but who Jesus is to us. Nobody else's faith is enough to save us. And once again, this is one of those topics that we got to in Sunday school. It was the faith of my mom getting us back into church that originally got me baptized. It was her belief in God that made me believe in God. However, that spiritual milk I received from the youth ministers and my parents and and the pastor I attended at the church growing up, it was that milk that got me to believe. However, it was just that. It was milk. And I've talked about this before, my own personal struggles with with faith and what I believe. And because my faith wasn't my own, because my faith was the faith of those who brought me up, my lack of faith failed me when times got hard. When my faith was tested, I failed because it wasn't my faith. It was the faith of everyone else except for me. It was not until you make your faith real that it becomes your faith. And then, that's when you have a confession to make, a personal decision made public. Once your faith becomes yours, then we get to the next step. Once your faith becomes Who is Jesus? Have you ever thought about that question before? Who is Jesus? I mean, sure, we read through Scripture and we read the amazing things he's done and we hear of the history and everything that he lived through, but have you ever stopped to think that Jesus is real? Oftentimes we read a book and we put him in the same category as like Superman or Batman or one of these fantastical characters that we read about. Oftentimes it's easy to distance ourselves from the word on a page. But yet Jesus was real. Jesus was just as real as me up here or you sitting down there. Do you allow yourself to ponder that? Jesus is a real man who grew up as a real baby to become a real teenager. We don't hear anything about Jesus after 12 years old. Once Jesus becomes a teenager, what what happened? I think those teenage years might have been left out for a purpose. But all jokes aside, Jesus was real, and Jesus grew, and Jesus lived in the same life that we grew, in the same life that we lived. Sure, we may have more technology, but people don't change. Humanity is still the same as it was in Jesus' time. And sure, there were some that believed in Jesus, but there are also others who didn't. I said in Sunday school this morning, for every one person that believed in Paul's writings and in Paul's teachings, there were probably about a thousand others who didn't. 
and hated Paul and despised Paul and beat Paul and stoned Paul and drove Paul out of town. Much would have been saying about Jesus. But if we look at chapter 16, verses 13 through 18 here, we get to see a little glimpse of who Jesus is. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus replied, you are blessed, Simon, son of John. Because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. You did not learn this from any human being. Now I say to you that you are Peter, which means rock. And upon this rock I will build my church, and all the powers of hell will not conquer it. Who do people say the Son of Man is? And then the disciples gave him some answers. Do you know what people around you say Jesus is. If your neighbor asked you, or if you asked your neighbor who Jesus is, what would they say? What would your family say who Jesus is? What would your friends say Jesus is? Do you know that answer? Do you know where your friends and family stand when it comes to Jesus? Because I will sadly admit, I don't. And that makes me a little nervous, just as it should make each of us a little nervous. We should all care what everyone around us thinks of Jesus. And I think this is what Jesus was getting at here when he asked, who do people say that the Son of Man is? But at the same time, he also asked them, who do you say I am? Because as much as we would like to answer who Jesus is, often those around us have an influence on who we say Jesus is. And Jesus knew that. That's why I believe Jesus started off with the question, who do people say the Son of Man is? And does that influence who you say I am? Jesus is very specific about the way he asks these questions on purpose. But who do you say I am? I think we should be able to answer that question each and every time we wake up in the morning. If Jesus was to ask us, who do you say I am, how would you respond to that? How would you answer that? And does your words that you say out loud, do those match what your heart would say? Although our mouths may say, oh, you are the Messiah and the Son of God, would our hearts say, but you're just another character in a story? in a book written 2,000 years ago. I think that's something we have to ponder this morning. Simon Peter answered, I find it interesting here if we stop for a second, look at this, verse 18 says, Simon Peter, but yet his name wasn't Simon Peter yet, it was simply just Simon. The Bible gives us a little hint into what's happening here. Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. This is who Jesus is. He is the Messiah, the Savior of the world, the Savior of his people, the shepherd to those who are lost. Are there any Ohio State fans? Any Ohio State fans? Now, usually there's three letters that go in front of Ohio State, isn't there? It is the Ohio State. The Ohio State University. Now notice, notice what, what Paul sa- or what Peter says here. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of the living God. Why is that? Oftentimes we just read the. But we should make a very great distinction here that it should be the. Because when we put the in front of these sentences or in front of these statements, it means there is only one. That's why we say the Ohio State University, because there is only one. It's uncomparable. 
There's nothing else like it. Nothing else matches it. Everything else is just a copy or replication. Nothing is as good as Jesus. He is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. He is the Son, the only Son. There is no other Son. There is no one else coming to save us. It is only Jesus, who is the Son of the living God, the only God, the only creator of heaven, the only creator of earth, the only one worthy of praise, and the only one worthy of glory. There is only one. That's why when we read this, we should read it as the Messiah, the Son of the living God, because there is no other way. Now Jesus replies and tells, him, tells Simon that you will be named Peter. You will become a rock because this was revealed to him by God. God revealed this to Simon Peter. It wasn't anybody else who revealed this. Sure, Jesus may have had influence because he was in partnership with Jesus. But ultimately, this was revealed to Simon Peter by God. This wasn't revealed to Simon Peter's wife. This wasn't revealed to Simon Peter's mother. This wasn't revealed to anybody else to teach Peter, except Peter made this his own. Jesus tells us that Peter believed this because God showed him. Not because anybody else showed him, but because God showed him. And because of that, Jesus' church, Jesus' people, will be able to be built upon that rock, built upon that belief that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is the Son of the living God. That's the rock in which the church is built. Not Peter himself, but Peter's belief of who is the Messiah, of who is the Son of the living God, who is the Son of Man. That's the rock in which we built. But this morning, I want us to ask a different question. Are we a rock? Do we confess the same things that Peter confesses? But do we believe it enough in our core convictions? Do we believe it enough that Jesus would say that a church could be built upon us and our faith? Are we strong enough and dedicated enough, as Peter was in his convictions, to do that? Because I think we should ask ourselves that question each and every day, as well as asking who Jesus is. First question should be, Jesus, who is Jesus? The next question should be, where is my faith in Jesus? Our next point here is confession is submission to Jesus. A confession is submission to Jesus. In this one, we'll go back to Romans, except this time we'll be in chapter 8. Chapter 8, verses 5 through 8 tell us here, Those who are dominated by sinful nature think about sinful things, but those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about things that please the Spirit. So letting your sinful nature control your mind leads to death. But letting the Spirit control your mind leads to life and peace. For the sinful nature is always hostile to God. It never did obey God's laws, and it never will. That's why those who are still under the control of their sinful nature can never please God. Those who are still under control of their sinful nature can never please God. If we go all the way back to January, I know that was a fairly long time ago, but if we go all the way back to January, I preached a sermon solely on peace, solely on shalom, and how much God wants shalom and peace in our lives. That is the goal. That is why Jesus came to conquer sin so we could live in peace. We could live in shalom. Hopefully you know that shalom is deeper than just everyday feeling okay. 
or in everyday living or the fact that there won't be wars because there still will be. That's not, what, that's not the peace that we're talking about because Jesus' peace is so much deeper than that. It's that peace knowing that no matter what, it's going to be okay. And so if we look at this and break this down a little bit, those who are dominated by their sinful nature will think about sinful things. A common phrase that a youth minister of a youth minister friend of mine used constantly was garbage in, garbage out. If you take garbage in, you'll just reproduce garbage. Right? The things you see, the things you hear, the people you're around, if they just spew constant garbage, then that's what's going to be in your mind. But also that sinful nature, we know the wages of sin is death. Now, oftentimes we read that verse, and if you ask the little kids in, in junior church back there whether what that means, they say, oh, well, if I do something bad, then I'll die. Hopefully we know that it's not an instantaneous thing, but is a gradual thing. It is an eternal thing. It's not just a this life scenario. It's an eternal life scenario. It's not just dying in this life, but it's dying over and over and over again in the eternal life. That's what damnation is. It's constant death and constant separation from God. But, and there is a but here, those who are controlled by the Holy Spirit think about holy things and things that please the Holy Spirit. By letting the Holy Spirit control, then leads to life and leads to peace. Leads to life and leads to peace. I think all of us could use a little more peace in our life. Could all use a little bit more shalom in our life. Could all use, as we talked about this morning in Sunday school, joy in our life. We talked about this this morning. I know I've mentioned this before, but... Happiness depends on your happenings. Happiness depends on your happenings. Happiness is a condition of the things around you. Joy is the condition of who and what is inside of you. Is the Holy Spirit inside of you? Are you being led to the Holy Spirit? Have you submitted yourself to Christ to allow peace and life to flourish inside of you? Because honestly, it's that simple. If you want more peace, seek the Holy Spirit. If you want to live life and live it abundantly, chase after Jesus. I know I made that sound really simple, didn't I? Because it really is that simple. It is humanity that added the 613 laws. It is humanity that keeps trying to put conditions on Jesus' love. How many times do we do that? If we get to the pearly gates, well, I hope I've done enough. We talked about that this morning. I hope I did enough. You can't seek your own salvation. You can't save yourself. As much as I can't save you. Your neighbor can't save you. Your spouse can't save you. Look around this room. No one in this room can save you. The only one who can save you has already done so. You just have to accept it. You just have to confess it with your mouth and with your heart. That's all we have to do. We're going to move into our time of invitation now, and I'll have Ann come back up and let this next song be be the prayer that leads us to invitation, leads us to confession. Because confessing that Jesus is Lord, repenting from sin, hearing the word and believing the word, these aren't just one-time things. You don't just take a flight of stairs up. Sometimes you need to take the flight of stairs back down. And that's what we're doing. These are steps towards salvation. And we'll go up, and we'll
we'll go down, and we'll go up, and we'll go down. This isn't an escalator or an elevator. This requires work. We have to be the ones to take the step. We have to be the ones to hear the word, to believe the word, to allow it to change us, and then allow us to confess. Not only to the people here, but to the world. Not with just words, but with our lives. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of your son. Lord, we thank you that he was as real as we are, as flesh and as bone as we are. But yet he was truly 100% God. He was 100% you and 100% man. That he willingly came down out of paradise to die for us. Lord, there should be no other reason except for that to confess who you are. To confess that Jesus is the Messiah, is the son of the living God, and there is no other way to heaven. There is no other way to you. There is no other way to escape the depravity of this world that we live in because of sin, except through you. Jesus, let us ponder these questions this morning. Let us come to terms with who Jesus truly is and whether our foundations are strong enough to carry that on. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.